mid-April 1957, at the Westinghouse Betty's nuclear power lab. A heavy cardboard box arrives from IBM. Inside is a thick stack of punched cards about 2,000. No manual, no explanation. Just a rumor, this might be a Fortran compiler. They have never seen one. IBM isn't even ready to ship a final version yet. But if it works, it could free them from hand coding endless missile and reactor calculations in raw machine instructions. They load the deck, add a tiny test program in the new language, and wait while the reader clatters through the cards. The program runs. The numbers are correct. Nobody in that room quite grasps it yet, but this accidental shipment has just proved something radical. A machine can translate algebra, like formulas into efficient code, fast enough for serious scientific work. To see how unlikely that moment really is, we have to go back, before Fortran, before IBM's mainframes, to a world where computation lives on paper instead of in memory. Long before Fortran, the United States is drowning in paperwork. The 1880 federal census takes more than seven years to process. Clark's tally marks by hand in endless columns, and by the time results are ready, the country has already changed. If nothing changes, future censuses will overlap. The government will be counting the nation with one hand and still adding up the last decade with the other. A young engineer at the Census Bureau, Herman Hollerith, proposes a way out. Represent each person as holes in a stiff card and let machines count the holes instead of humans reading ink marks. His electromechanical tabulators use metal pins and electrical contacts to read those cards. With them, the 1890 census finishes in record time. Hollerith's company grows, merges, and eventually becomes part of a new conglomerate. In 1924, under Thomas J. Watson Sr., it takes a new name, International Business Machines, IBM. That same year, far from the Census Bureau, a boy is born who will eventually teach IBM's machines to understand something closer to human mathematics. John Warner Backus grows up in Wilmington, Delaware, in a comfortable but strict household. His father is a successful stockbroker, expectations are high, patience is limited. Bacchus drifts through elite schools, clever but unmotivated, flunking courses and patching them up in summer school. The pattern is clear even to him. He isn't afraid of work, he just hates pointless drudgery. He tries chemistry at his father's urging, skips labs, and is expelled. Drafted into the army in 1943, he is sent into technical training and discovers that when problems are concrete and demanding, he can throw himself into the work. After the war, he samples engineering, medicine, and radio repair. One day in New York City, he wanders past an IBM showroom filled with electric typewriters, calculators, and tabulating machines. Curiosity pulls him inside. That small detour leads to a job at IBM and eventually to the idea that will change how humans talk to computers. Before we go further, a quick note. This video is co-presented by Code Rabbit, an AI platform redefining how developers write, review, and refine code. In the early 1950s, Bacchus is programming IBM's flagship scientific computer, 701. Highlights the IBM 701 electronic data processing machine of 1953, the first in IBM's successful 700 series. The vacuum tube-based IBM 701 was a high-speed computer that was designed to solve large problems in scientific and engineering computation. Programming the 701 means writing long sequences of numeric codes or assembly mnemonics. Every jump, every register, Every memory location must be managed by hand. Programs live as stacks of punched cards. A single mispunched digit can wreck hours of machine time. Programmers take pride in this intimate control. Their craft feels exclusive and arcane, but it is painfully slow. Months of effort can produce a program that runs for a few hours and may need to be rewritten when the hardware changes. Bacchus is good at this work and hates it. He wants the machine to handle more of the bookkeeping so people can focus on the mathematics. He leads an early experiment called speed coding for the 701, an interpreted system that simulates floating, point math and other conveniences. It makes programs easier to write, but every high-level operation turns into many low, level ones at runtime. The price is speed. The lesson is clear. A higher-level language is the right idea, but an interpreter isn't enough. There has to be a way to write code like algebra and still run it at machine speed. In late 1953, Bacchus sends his manager, Cuthbert Hurd, a bold memo. IBM, he argues, should build an automatic programming system for its next computer, the IBM 704. Programmers would write formulas, loops, and conditions in something close to mathematical notation. A compiler would translate them into efficient machine instructions. Bacchus sets a harsh standard. 
the compiled code must run almost as fast as careful hand, written machine language. If it is much slower, serious programmers won't use it. Many colleagues think this is impossible. They believe real programming demands intimate knowledge of the machine. No mechanical method can match the tricks experts use to squeeze performance out of limited hardware. Some quietly dismiss Bacchus as lazy, trying to avoid the hard work they consider essential. Yet IBM sees the potential. The company's expensive new machines need software, and rewriting everything in low-level code for each model is unsustainable. Bacchus gets a small budget and a mandate. If he can assemble a team and make this compiler work, he won't just change IBM's machines. He'll change programming itself. While Bacchus plans his compiler, IBM engineers designed the IBM 704. The IBM 704 computer was the first mass-produced computer with floating-point arithmetic hardware. The Type 704 electronic data processing machine is a large-scale, high-speed electronic calculator. Unlike earlier machines, the 704 has built-in floating-point arithmetic and index registers. Magnetic core memory replaces older, fragile technologies. The machine is faster than its predecessor, but more importantly, its instruction set is shaped with automatic programming in mind. Bacchus and the hardware team talk. The compiler will generate certain patterns of instructions over and over. The 704 can be tuned to execute those patterns efficiently. For the first time, a major computer is being designed not just for humans to program directly, but as a target for a high-level language. Bacchus begins recruiting. By the end of 1955, he has assembled the programming research group inside IBM. Harlan Herrick, Irving Ziller, David Sayer, Peter Sheridan, Roy Nutt, Richard Goldberg, Lois Haybet and others bring a mix of mathematics, physics and practical coding experience. Many are young, new to computing, and attracted by the challenge more than by any formal career plan. One member later compares them to a team of heroes with different powers. Together, they must do what most experts say can't be done, build a compiler that reads algebra and writes code nearly as tight as a human expert. The office atmosphere is intense but informal. Arguments happen at blackboards, not in memos. Bacchus shields the group from corporate politics and lets them experiment, as long as they keep moving toward one goal. Prove that a high-level language does not have to mean slow programs. Before the compiler can be finished, the language itself has to be defined. In November 1954, Bacchus, Zilla, and Herrick release a preliminary report describing a language with formulas, arrays, loops, conditional branches, and subroutines. It reads like a blueprint for the future of scientific computing. They also need a name. After weeks of bad suggestions, Bacchus arrives with one that sticks, the IBM Mathematical Formula Translating System, Fortran. Around the same time, in September 1954, Herrick runs a tiny program in the new language on the 704 with prototype tools. It's a small step, but it proves the concept a computer can execute code written in a syntax designed for humans, not machines. To make real programs possible, the team introduces the Fortran coding form, a strict BT, column layout where each line becomes one punched card. It's still physical and fragile, but now the text on those cards can look like the equations scientists recognize from their notebooks. By late 1956, the Fortran compiler has grown into a massive multi-pass program. It passes arithmetic expressions, allocates registers, reorders loops, and applies aggressive optimizations. Early users, however, run into bugs. Some compilations fail halfway through. Some programs crash at runtime. Features are missing or incomplete. To many observers, it looks like confirmation that automatic programming is a nice idea that doesn't really work. Skeptics argue that no compiler can match handcrafted assembly. They call Fortran a toy for amateurs and predict that no respectable programmer will rely on it. Bacchus's team knows the stakes, one widely known case where a Fortran program runs much slower than an equivalent assembly version that could kill the project. They pour months into tuning and fixing, tightening code paths and repairing obscure edge cases. Slowly, results change. Programs compile cleanly more often. On many scientific workloads, matrix operations, differential equations, simulations, the generated code rivals, and sometimes beats handwritten assembly. The compiler never gets tired it applies, its optimizations consistently. By the fall of 1958, more than half of IBM's 704 sites are using Fortran for most of their programming. At some, it accounts for 80% of the code being written. And that misrouted deck at Westinghouse Betty's. It proves that engineers with no special training in the language can learn it quickly, write real programs, and trust the results. Fortran isn't just powerful, it's usable. 
Once Fortran proves itself on the IBM 74, something unexpected happens. Other manufacturers realize that, if they support Fortran, they can attract IBM users without forcing them to rewrite huge code bases. A language originally meant to tie customers to IBM hardware becomes a bridge that lets them consider switching machines. Independent Fortran compilers appear on rival systems. In the 1960s, standards efforts strip away machine-specific quirks and define a portable core so that a Fortran program can, at least in principle, run on different computers. New languages appear, Algol, COBOL, BASIC, C, borrowing ideas from Fortran and reacting against its limits. But they all build on the same proof, you can abstract away the machine without giving up performance. Bacchus himself will later criticize the programming style that Fortran helped establish and explore radically different paradigms. Yet his rebellion against hand-coded drudgery has already reshaped computing. Programming has shifted from hand-to-hand -hand combat with the machine. Guarded by a small priesthood, to a higher level conversation in formulas, loops and arrays that thousands of scientists and engineers can share. From census clerks tallying marks on paper, to nuclear engineers feeding Fortran decks, into roaring mainframes, the story is clear. Humans push their repetitive labor onto machines so they can spend more time thinking. And in 1957, when a mistaken box of punched cards runs correctly in a Maryland lab, the world gets its first undeniable proof that computers can help write their own programs so that we can focus on the ideas instead of the holes in the cards.